have music within us, and we communicate it with every gesture we make. I'm not talking about dancers, although, of all people, they're probably the most aware of the intimate connection between physical movement and sound. And I'm not just talking about conductors, although, obviously, as a conductor, that's going to be my starting point. People often ask me, what exactly does a conductor do? Well, uh, it's our job to take the notes written by a composer and give them an emotional shape to convey the composer's ideas. To get from what's in the head of, say, J.S. Bach, up there on his cloud, or Judith, who might be sitting in the hall behind me, these ideas have to be transmitted through the medium of print and then filtered through my body and the bodies of the musicians. I use gestures to draw the music out of the players or the singers in a way that I think conveys what the composer is trying to say. Now, I say I think, but actually I'm not just relying on my own ideas. In the world of Western classical music, pieces written by composers generally give us a very good idea of how to play them. I'll have a conducting score in front of me with the whole piece in it. Uh, the musicians will have their own individual parts on their music stands, and they'll play what they read, so not just the notes, but also detailed instructions about how fast or how loud to play them, what kind of attack to use, and so on. There are a lot of clues in there about how to realize the composer's ideas. So, you may ask, what's the point of having a conductor at all? Well, our job isn't trivial, even just on the level of coordination. We do have to give a certain amount of traffic signals. After all, it's important that the musicians all start together and stop together. Thank you. But beyond that, we're trying to communicate the essence of the music. I'd like to demonstrate that by taking out the element of reading the clues. If the piece hasn't already been written down, is there an essence that we can draw out of thin air, a, an emotional impact that doesn't depend on the notes? Well, when musicians improvise together in a small group, we can shift our focus from reading what's in front of us to listening to one another by reacting to what we hear someone else playing, maybe taking their idea and developing it, running away with it, bouncing it back and forth, the group creates a piece of music together. The musicians listen in a different way, responding to one another rather than planning out how they're going to play what's in front of them. I'll show you what I mean. Um, Sophia, start us off with a bass line, just something jaunty. <laughs> Okay, loath as I am to interrupt you, and they could go on for quite a while. I've heard them working together, and it's lovely. But I want to introduce a new element, which is I'd like to ask them now to respond to what I'm doing. So they're going to be converting my physical gestures into musical ones. <coughs> it's exactly what they do when there is music on the stand in front of them, but we've taken that away, so this is what's left. So, for example, um, if I make a gesture like this... It's going to have a very different effect from this. that, I'm asking 
how it happens. What's just happened there? And it was all improvised. Is it some kind of magic trick? Am I perhaps someone with a superpower? Can anyone do it? Or do you have to be a musician? Well, uh, I believe that you don't have to be what you might think of as musical in order to make music out of thin air. With these musicians reacting to you, your physical presence will translate into sound. Do I have a volunteer <laughs> to test out this theory? Come on then, up you come. If you wouldn't mind just standing there, do anything. I might stop you, but feel free. Well done. <laughs> Here we go. So how did that feel? Very nice. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Any sort of adjective? Um, it was pleasurable to be able to feel them respond. So the pleasure was in the response that you got from them? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Again, if you just stand there and off you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. I wish we had time for everyone to have a go because it really is a lot of fun. <laughs> and thank you. One of the words that people often use when they have this experience, uh, when I say, what did it feel like? They say, empowering. Because um, sometimes we get empowerment from quite unexpected quarters. And I'd like to take that idea and ask you for a moment to think about power not in its hierarchical meaning, but in the sense of electricity. Because what we're doing here is switching on the power or plugging into the power supply and then conducting this electricity into the group of people in front of us. Our hands, our faces, and in fact our whole bodies become a conduit for this power. And this is where what I do with music is something we all do, you all do, in your daily lives, in various work or social situations. You're having a job interview. You're teaching a class about Shakespeare or the spinning jenny. You're in a committee meeting. You're having coffee with a group of friends. We all conduct our relationships with individuals and with groups of people. How we create music in the world is very much dependent on how we occupy space, what we do in and with the space between us and other people. Simply how we are in a very physical sense is fundamentally part of communication. So all the time 
we have the opportunity to communicate the music within us, whether it's turbulent or angry or, or joyful or just tired and miserable. Whatever the music inside you, you are already conducting something of your essence to the people around you and for them. Because part of what you're doing is channeling your music but at the same time, you're empowering other people to express the music within them. Now, I don't want you to think that when I'm conducting a piece of music, it's necessarily my emotions that I'm transmitting to the musicians. And in fact, sometimes what I'm feeling couldn't be further from what's in the music. I'll give you an example. Um, some years ago, I was conducting a concert of lovely Christmas music. I came back after the rehearsal and I took a phone call to tell me that my little godson, who had been ill for some time, had just died. Well, I raged and I cried, but the show must go on. So I did what performers do. I put on my concert suit, picked up my baton and went on stage. I have very little memory of that concert. <laughs> but curiously, people who were there said things like how well I brought the music across. I mean, how on earth could this happen? The music was serene. It was joyous. So I was clearly not communicating what I was actually feeling inside, which was shock and grief. Nor do I think I was putting my feelings away in a box. I think that's something that's really unhelpful for musicians to do because we are trying to be a pure channel for the music. And if we lock our emotions away, we are blocking that channel. What I think was going on was that the immediacy of these very strong emotions, the sheer power of them, not the feelings themselves, had somehow opened me up so that I was able to transmit the spirit of the music. So the thoughts I'd like to leave you with are, believe that you too have music within you, however literally or <coughs> metaphorically you want to take that. And don't be afraid of your feelings, because they can empower you with your own electricity. Your challenge, then, is to trust that you are conducting your own music through your own power lines in your relationships and out into the world. Make it matter. <laughs> and thank you.